Hello and welcome to the Cadre Journal. I'm Joseph. And I'm Eric. And today on what would have been his 98th birthday, we're doing a short discussion and introduction to the theories and life of Amilcar Cabral, who was the leader of the PAIGC of Guinea-Bissau. So to begin, Merrick, I don't know if you want to give us a bit of an introduction to Guinea-Bissau itself, uh, the conditions in which Amilcar Cabral was raised and began his fighting. For sure. So Guinea-Bissau uh, and Cabo Verde, where Amilcar Cabral's parents were from originally, were, were both at one point Portuguese colonies, uh, originally colonized in the 18th century, um, part of the wider African uh, Portuguese colonies, which included Angola and Mozambique. Uh, Portugal had a very large interest in uh, Africa and had kept control over African countries and African land for a very long time, well after World War II. What makes Cabo Verde or Cape Verde different from a lot of other African nations was kind of this mixed heritage. Uh, they speak a Portuguese Creole, uh, which is similar to the kind of Portuguese Creole they speak in Guinea-Bissau, which is unlike Angola and Mozambique, which has a more, you could say, a more Portuguese, in like Portuguese in the sense of the country, Portugal speaking. Um, and Amico Cabral, uh, his parents were originally from Cabo Verde, uh, but he was born in Guinea-Bissau and grew up in a, a time when uh, a lot of African people who were colonized by Portugal went to Lisbon to study. It was part of the larger Portuguese structure, which tried to keep the elite connected with Portugal in order to maintain the, the colonial holdings and to main that remain uh, connected through people. And I think, Joseph, you, you have more to say about his time in, in Portugal. Yeah, definitely. And thanks for that introduction. So in 1945, he obtains a scholarship to go study agronomy in Lisbon. He is a student at the state created the House of the Students of the Empire as an agronomy student. But there he founds the African Studies Center in 1948 in Lisbon, which is opposing the ruling dictatorship of Portugal at the time and also promoting the cause of independence for the Portuguese colonies in Africa, which at the time were Mozambique, Angola, and Guinea-Bissau, and Cabo Verde, and South Man principally as well. And while he was there, he met some fellow activists and fellow students who were from Portugal's African colonies, specifically Agostino Neto and Eduardo Mondlane, who were respectively the leaders of the independence movements in Angola and Mozambique. And so you have this incredible coming together of three of the most important leaders of the independence movements in, in Portugal's colonies in Africa, and they're all strategizing and learning socialist theory together. And this is what Cab Cabral would later call his seven years in the metropolis of developing his theory and getting to intimately know the empire. From the interior, he's, he learns about fascism in Portugal and its colonial policies. Then he goes in 1952, he's employed by the Colonial Forestry and Agricultural Civil Service. He conducts a comprehensive census of the country, and he literally travels to every village in the entire country, doing observations, learning about how the colonial structure of agriculture has deeply underdeveloped the country. And in this time of, as he's traveling around the entire country, he begins his work mobilizing the local populations. This experience, in his own words, provided him with ample opportunity to learn firsthand of the dire poverty and intense suffering of his people, especially in the countryside. And his experiences made him more determined than ever to find ways and means of working for the freedom of his country and delivering his people from the yoke of colonial bondage. So what he was also doing, I think, is also very interesting to study, that he was studying his country's soil topography and crop production, which he observed was organized on the basis of an imperialist single crop economy. So he began, like he's writing and reporting about that fact that Guinea-Bissau, its agriculture is literally established to have one crop to export to Portugal. And that's literally all that it's for. A really interesting point within this time that he's employed is that he goes in 1955 and participates in the Bendon Conference. So he's meeting a lot of other anti-colonial theorists and activists of the time. And while he's studying the agriculture and topography of 
he gets into a lot of conflict with the governor of the colony because he's been organizing so many of, of his fellow activists and, and especially anti-colonial activists. And the governor transfers him for a short period to Angola, where he helps found the MPLA with Agostino Neto, who he had met in Portugal, which would then go on to be to still to this day, the Liberation Party of Angola. Uh, and then in 1956, he establishes the African Party for the Independence of Guinea and Cabo Verde, which is the PAIGC. Having spent his first years doing political work in the cities, the PAIGC would then, after 1959, focus extensively on the countryside. And in 1963, the PAIGC begins an armed guerrilla insurgency. Within 10 years, it achieves control over most of Guinea's territory and declares independence. In 1971, Cabral had argued for the creation of a people's assembly that could organize and run the independent Guinea, but unfortunately he wouldn't be able to live to see that. On the 20th of January 1973, just months before the victory of the national liberation struggle, he was assassinated. And it's speculated as to who assassinated him it is very likely with the help of Portuguese agents operating within the PIGC itself, although there are a lot of rumors that it was carried out by agents of the Agenter Press, which was Portugal's branch of Gladio, which was a kind of NATO, U.S. NATO paramilitary organization at the time that would have been operating and doing these counterinsurgency, uh, really anti-liberation uh, assassinations. So that's kind of an introduction to his biography. We could talk a lot more about kind of the work that the PAGC did in Guinea-Bissau, and that's a very interesting topic to look at their pedagogy, how they approached the revolutionary struggle. But I think we can transition to talking about two texts that we read from Cabral to talk about him today. So, Merrick, if you want to begin with talking about the text you read, and then I'll go with mine. For sure. Uh, so I read the Nationalist Movements of Portuguese Colonies. It was uh, an address to the CONGC, uh, which was essentially a meeting uh, of the different uh, liberation struggles going on in uh, Africa against Portuguese colonialism. So the MPLA for Limo, uh, PAIGC, and the party uh, from Santome Tome uh, were all there in attendance uh, in varying degrees. And so Cabral talks a lot about the collective struggle that uh, the African people uh, are, who are fighting against Portugal are facing. Uh, he he tries to tie the, the history um, of their struggle together. And beyond that, he also tries to tie their struggle with other struggles, such as the struggle in Vietnam, the struggle in Palestine, the struggle of even uh, black African-Americans. Um, so he tries to really have an international uh, analysis of anti-colonialism and anti-imperialism. Um, and it's kind of this you know, driving speech to get people to work together to to see the the larger issue at hand uh, and to create unity and solidarity. Awesome. Uh, and then I can talk a little bit about the text I read. Uh, I read probably Cabral's, I think one of the pieces that he's most well known for, uh, which is it's entitled The Weapon of Theory. And it was delivered at the Tricontinental Congress in Cuba. So he begins the speech kind of making a reference to the fact that he's at the Tricontinental, uh, I believe it was in 1966, that he's delivering the address. So he starts, and I would kind of divide this speech uh, or this essay, it's been converted into an essay format, into a couple of different sections. In the first, he's arguing about the fact that, and, and I would say that overall he's laying out what he calls the foundations and objectives of national liberation in relation to social revolution or to social structure. So the theme of the essay is kind of talking about the role national liberation plays in a socialist revolution or anti-colonial revolution. Then he, he starts by kind of talking about the fact that there's an attempt to convince colonized people that they didn't have a history before colonialism. So he says, what that leads to a general discussion within the context of like socialism as well is the fact that some say even before class struggle as such, there was no history of colonized people that only now there is like a history within class struggle. So he says, this history began only with the development of the phenomenon of class and consequently of class struggle. 
And so he's, he's trying to assert to the audience that colonized peoples, especially at the Tricontinental Congress, have had their own history before imperialism. But now, of course, the introduction of imperialism, which he defines as a worldwide expression of the search of, for profits and the ever-increasing accumulation of surplus value by monopoly financial capital. That imposition of imperialism has led to the necessity to reassert the validity of the history uh, before imperialism of people who were colonized. And that's kind of the whole point of national liberation struggle is asserting the fact that there was a history, there will be a history in the future. And he says, the, coloni the colonialists usually say that it was they who brought us into history. Today we show that this is not so. They made us leave our history to follow them right at the back, to follow the progress of their history. Today in taking up arms to liberate ourselves, in following the examples of other peoples to liberate themselves, we want to return to our history on our own feet, by our own means and through our own sacrifices. The second section is discussing how imperialism kind of preempted the, the independent history and how anti-imperial struggle can bring that history back. Then he dedicates a third section to talking about neocolonialism. It's a really interesting section where he's discussing how he says, in the case of neocolonialism, the imperialist action takes the form of creating a local bourgeoisie or a pseudo bourgeoisie controlled by the ruling class of the dominant country. And he sees the struggle against neocolonialism as the next phase of national liberation struggle after direct colonial rule has been cut off by political independence. And then he talks about the fact that then so then the fourth section is kind of clarifying what is national liberation he says we can state that national liberation is the phenomenon in which a given socio-economic whole rejects the negation of its historical process in other words the national liberation of a people is the regaining of the historical personality of that people its return to history through the destruction of the imperialist domination to which it was subjected and one of the most interesting conclusions he comes to from this is saying that in order to fight imperialism and have this national liberation struggle to make it progressive, you need to have an alliance of the peasants, the proletariat, as well as what he talks about in the fourth section, the section that I think a lot of people have discussed and had a lot of interesting opinions on, is he's talking about the concept of class suicide. The basically the petty bourgeoisie of the formerly colonized countries needs to commit class suicide and instead of going naturally towards like their more bourgeois tendencies, they need to join with the peasantry and the proletariat and commit to revolting against neocolonialism. So on the topic of class suicide, he says, uh, to, re to retain the power which national liberation puts in its hands, the petty bourgeoisie has only one path, to give free reign to its natural tendencies, to become mo more bourgeois, to permit the development of a bureaucratic and intermediary bourgeoisie in the commercial cycle, that is to say, in order to negate the revolution, in order not to betray these objectives, the petty bourgeoisie has only one choice, to strengthen its revolutionary consciousness, to reject the temptations of becoming more bourgeois and the natural concerns of its class mentality, to identify itself with the working classes and not to oppose the normal development of the process of revolution. This means that in order to truly fulfill the role in the national liberation struggle, the revolutionary petty bourgeoisie must be capable of committing suicide as a class in order to be reborn as revolutionary workers, completely identified with the deepest aspirations of the people to which they belong. And then his final statement on this is to say, this alternative to betray the revolution or to commit suicide as a class constitutes the dilemma of the petty bourgeoisie in the general framework of the national liberation struggle. And he positively quotes what Fidel Castro had called the development of revolutionary consciousness amongst the petty bourgeoisie. I think we can relate that as we were talking at the beginning to his own origin as someone who is going to become an agronomist in the metropolitan capital. He was not going to be with the working class, but he had an active revolutionary consciousness when he went to Portugal and kind of developed this consciousness. And we would see this in the PIGC's program over time, that they would encourage a lot of petty bourgeois people to become militants to become teachers to use the skills they developed in a petty bourgeois institution or setting and devote them to national liberation so that's the summary of, of that second text that we read and we can discuss them both a little bit i don't know if you have any thoughts on his discussions of class suicide of national liberation 
I think that text is really, honestly, one of the most incredible, inspiring pieces I've ever read. It really gets positively cited um, in a lot of different disciplines in trying to theorize what like a national liberation Marxism looks like. So, yeah, any thoughts on that text? Yeah, for sure. So I, I read um, another one of his texts kind of a while ago, and I read it in, in Portuguese, so I, I forgot to mention it before, but um, I, I read a, a text called uh, uh, Liberation, National Liberation and Culture. Sorry. Liberação Nacional e Cultural. Uh, and he talks, when, when you started talking about um, kind of the, the way that imperialism affects people, and affects like the the way that a group of people moves forward. It reminded me of what he he said. Um, he said the principal characteristic of any kind of imperialist domination is the negation of the historical development of the oppressed people by means of the violent takeover of the free process of the development of the productive forces. Um, and it just kind of reminded me that you know imperialism is this very dynamic and destructive element. Uh, and not only does it destroy our social and cultural relations with each other, but it, it, of course, principally destroys our economic relations with each other and with and our relationship with with our natural resources. Imperialism doesn't only stop the progress of culture, but also the progress of the productive forces. You know, and so, you know, it, I think that when you read these these texts, these variety of texts, you see that Cabral really has this very expansive idea of what imperialism is and what it looks like for oppressed people for colonized people and i feel like as you read through you get a uh, a much deeper connection with the history and the the reality of imperialism just just how broadly it affects people i would say um i don't know if you have more to add on that but that's just kind of what i was thinking that that, that break in history yeah, I, I think what you mentioned is really important. That is a really big factor in this text, uh, theory, the weapon of theory, when he's defining imperialism. He actually talks quite a bit about the role that imperialism played in in hindering or preventing the productive development of the development of productive forces as it naturally would occur. I just want to read this quote where he says, the important thing for our people is, is to know whether imperialism and its role as capital in action has fulfilled in our countries its historical mission. The acceleration of the process of development of the productive forces and their transformation in the sense of increasing complexity in the means of production. And then he concludes that it's very obvious that imperialist capital has not remotely fulfilled the historical mission carried out by capital in the countries of accumulation. So it's, it's very interesting to also observe what he's saying that imperialism isn't like capitalism in a country like Portugal, which you would have observed, which has developed the productive forces to the nature of, as he also says, dividing the bourgeoisie from the proletariat. That's what even creates in the context of, of a country like Guinea-Bissau, the nature of, of a group like the petty bourgeoisie that can play a rather large role in the post-colonial environment or what he describes as the neo-colonial environment, that these petty bourgeois people that would be someone like him, like well-educated students, bureaucrats, people who work for kind of civil service, who play a large role in the functioning of the state, a post-colonial or neo-colonial state, but oftentimes are more interested in serving the bourgeoisie or tending towards their bourgeois side, rather than tending towards what we'd see as the petty or petite side of the working class. So he, his whole concept of class suicide is really based around the fact that the petty bourgeoisie only exists in such a large capacity in a country like Guinea-Bissau because imperialism has underdeveloped the country and creates this class that has a natural inclination towards uh, the working class. But I think when he's discussing national liberation, he's also clear to say that while there could be a struggle against colonialism on a nationalist basis, that there's a broad, what he calls a horizontal alliance that stretches from the peasantry to the national bourgeoisie in a neo-colonial situation where there's now a vertical structure of domination that the national bourgeoisie oppresses the working class, the peasantry, and the petty bourgeoisie. There's less of a broad alliance, and now it has to be conducted. As he says, national liberation can only be a socialist process in a neo-colonial environment, and that's why he sees the struggle against neo-colonialism as the next step for socialist national liberation specifically. 
his 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 analysis of of imperialism is like something that's very great to read. I, I've been so happy to read through it. It reminds me a lot of like Andre Gunderfrank and how the kind of like way the world system because he because Cabral really looks at the whole world um, and like in the text that I read where he talks about you know the struggle in Palestine, the struggle in Vietnam, he sees imperialism as a global issue, um, and that the struggle for anti-imperialism is also a global issue and an issue of global solidarity and you know when he was in portugal uh you know meeting with people from mozambique meeting with people from angola meeting with people from all over you know the colonies that portugal has established you know um but through the process of imperialism you know new forms of solidarity had been created um and i think that's like something that's very very interesting to think about absolutely and i think even something that really stands out to me is that we did a little bit of background reading and hopefully it could be in a, a future episode to talk about the like revolutionary strategy of the PAIGC itself. One of the most interesting features of it is this kind of militant education program that they have. And like something that I know that's been discussed a little bit in different articles has been the fact that Emil Cabral's pedagogy very much inspired Paulo Freire later on of kind of the approach of, of teaching and like how education can be a liberatory force within an anti-colonial struggle. So the pedagogy that they had was, you know, teaching children like in the same context as doing like a Portuguese, a Portuguese class. And then they would also do like teach the kid the program of the PIGC itself. So like make it into like understandable language that you can teach the history of Guinea-Bissau and the program in very you know simple and straightforward pedagogy so that's mm -hmm. what's inspiring to read is the fact that like you can have this kind of uh, as you were talking about this kind of solidarity that he even saw when he was in lisbon between angolans between mozambicans and and guinea bissauans of this kind of like connected in the like lusophone africa kind of connections and then when he goes to angola he's finding the exact same sort of struggle is very interconnected there. And I think that all relates to what you were mentioning with national liberation and culture, also another excellent writing of his that what he was really about was kind of uncovering the, the fact that colonialism and imperialism of one of, you know, of all the atrocities that they had conducted was covering up the history of these countries of expressing that they didn't have a culture, that there was no kind of like, you know, culture. And sometimes I think even as you know, people who are opposed to colonialism or to imperialism, there's a desire to say like, well, you know, colonialism has occurred. People just use French or Portuguese or English now. So that's how we have to engage things. But he was really about kind of like trying to revitalize, not trying to romanticize or idealize pre-colonial history, but trying to revitalize it and situate it properly within the context of struggle, while also concluding like there's another good essay we'll talk about in within the next week uh, which draws on his kind of like modernist philosophy that he talks a lot about the fact that you couldn't go back to a kind of like idealized pre-colonial situation. Um, and that's why you see like his desire to engage with Portuguese even as a language is a product of his kind of like ability to recognize what unites people in a sort of modern world and while also trying to reconcile that with revitalizing national like national liberation as a process to revitalize culture and history itself which are quite incredible to mention very quickly like uh him going to the bandung conference and he also has quite a bit of writing about like the non-aligned movement um and i feel like you know it it really the the way that he explains it is that you know instead of it being against one block or another what it's really about is giving autonomy and giving the you know power for you know colonized people to to make a decision about how they want to run their countries um and just the fact that he is interested in bandung and interested in you know how these different you know colonized formerly colonized semi semi colonized peoples can you know interact uh you know together and and it, you know go it goes back the pedagogy i think you know how do we learn about imperialism how do we learn about the history you know collective history where do we start with where do we go i think you know they all they all tie together and they all connect 
Definitely. And I, I want to just draw out two last quotes that I think are really good to talk specifically about his pedagogy, because I think that's such a big part of his theory that we can't really ignore. So he has this incredible quote talking about the content of the conversations in the PAGC education uh, that he was conducting, where he says, telling the people that the land belongs to those who work on it was not enough to mobilize them because we have to find more than we have more than enough land. Here's all the land we need. We had to find appropriate formulae for mobilizing our peasants instead of using terms that our people could not yet understand. We could never mobilize our people simply on the basis of the struggle against colonialism. That has no effect. To speak of the fight against imperialism is not convincing enough. Instead, we use a direct language that all can understand. Why are you going to fight? What are you? What is your father? What has happened to your father up to now? What is the situation? Did you pay taxes? Did your father pay taxes? What have you seen from those taxes? How much do you get for your ground nuts? Have you thought about how much you will earn with your ground nuts? How much sweat has it cost your family? Which of you has been imprisoned? You're going to work on road building. Who gives you the tools? You're bringing the tools. Who provides your meals? You provide your meals. But who walks on the road? Who has a car? And your daughter who was raped? Are you happy about that? So this kind of direct language that he used to engage the peasantry and to engage people that he, they were trying to liberate, but he couldn't just mobilize them simply by using abstract language around imperialism. And then this final quote, which I think is, is incredible, from him in 1951. Whether in, in Cabo Verde or anywhere else in the world, education is the fundamental basis that underpins the work of the emancipation of every human being and the conscientization of mankind, not in relation to individual or class needs or conveniences, but in relation to the environment in which he lives, to the needs of the community, and to the problems of humanity in general. Today, education aims at the full realization of man without distinguishing race or origin as a conscious, intelligent, useful, and progressive being integrated into the world and his geographic, economic, and social environment without any sort of submission. For this and because of this, the issue of education cannot be treated separately from the socioeconomic question. So this is the kind of pedagogy that he had. And I think this really informs, it informed Paulo Freire, of course, so much, but even informs us about like our desire to teach about imperialism and about colonialism, rather than using such abstract and complicated uh, terminology. Of course, that theory is very important, but as he says, theory as a weapon has to also be primed and sharpened to have the most direct impact. It's blunted if it's used in this abstract, inconvenient language that doesn't immediately have an impact. And I think by that series of questions, you can see the kinds of things he was trying to draw out, like who has ownership, who works, but even more than that, like have you thought about your family? Have you thought about the conditions of the people you care about who live under colonialism? That was the way that he got people to care, to fight against colonialism and imperialism. Yeah. And and talking about Paul Freire and, you know, the pedagogy of the oppressed, you know, Paul Freire talks quite a bit about the use of dialogue and the 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 kind of counter to the to the system of just me pure memorization, pure memorization. You know, you read a book and you memorize it. He's really interested in how dialogue and how communication is a tool for oppressed people to not only liberate themselves, but also learn and to develop ways of learning and thinking. Um, and when I heard, you know, Cabral's questioning and the PAIGC's questioning and, you know, how they interacted with people in the, you know, in the field, um, it just reminds me of that, that critical essential point of dialogue. And I, and I think in a lot of ways, Cadre is uh, based on, you know, the Cadre journal is based on that idea of dialogue as a form of education and dialogue as a form of, you know, liberation, really. Um, and I, and I feel like, you know, as, as we read through these and we think about what those questions really mean for those people in that time period in that certain place for colonized people, even today, um, you know, there's so much to be learned and so much to grow from, from just that idea of dialogue. Definitely. I think that's a really good point to kind of wrap this discussion up on is kind of interpreting Cabral's legacy for everything that we're interested in doing. So thank you so much for watching. Thanks for listening. Merrick, thanks so much again for helping us kind of explain, explicate Emilcar Cabral a little bit more. And it was a pleasure kind of doing this discussion. Hopefully we can do more of these in the future. Yes. Always a pleasure to talk about some great leaders.
Yeah, absolutely. All right, cool. Have a good one. I'll get by my dad.